Hi, and today we're going to be discussing the theory that dictates what shape molecules take when they form covalent bonds. And this is known as the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. It's often referred to as VESPA theory, V-S-E-P-R. So let's get started and have a look at the shape of our molecules. So valence shell electron pair repulsion theory was originally developed around the 1940s um, at Oxford University. It was then refined further in University College London and is now the prevailing theory that explains how molecules arrange their bonds around a central atom and the shapes that then further give rise to the way that molecules behave. It is essentially a theory that is a model that predicts the shape of molecules based on how much pairs of electrons repel in the molecular structure. It's based on the idea that pairs of electrons will have different levels of repulsion and therefore will arrange themselves based on how much they're repelling each other. And that overall, essentially, because electrons are all charged the same, they're all negatively charged, they will want to arrange themselves around the atom as far as hard as possible. So if you think if we have a central atom that has a number of bonds attached to it, these are going to want to, in three-dimensional space, be as far apart as possible. And we often draw atom representations in two dimensions. So it we really need to be able to think about this in three-dimensional space because our atoms are in three dimensions rather than just the way we represent them on the page in two dimensions. So the shape depends on the number of bonding pairs and non-bonding pairs because if you can think about it, bonding pairs that are shared between two atoms are going to have a different density, the electron density, the non-bonding pairs that are, are together and not being distributed between those two nuclei. Okay, so the shape is dependent on how many bonding pairs and non-bonding pairs we have and how many are surrounded around the central atom. The bond angle is defined as the angle between the atoms bonded to the central atom. So if we had a look here, we can see that we would have a bond angle here between HCH. We're going to make this bond angle in here. So non-bonding pairs are important in determining the shape of the molecule. We don't count them in terms of defining bond angles for them, only remembering to understand the shape that they give. So the levels of repulsion are defined in this way. A non-bonding pair and non-bonding pair will have greater repulsion than between a non-bonding pair and a bonding pair, which has greater repulsion than a bonding pair and bonding pair. We can consider this in a water molecule because it has all of these interactions present. If we think about here, each line represents a bonding pair. And then our dots up here represent non-bonding pairs. I'll use NBP to shorten this. But what it's saying is that the repulsion felt between these pairs of electrons up here is going to be greater than the repulsion felt between the non-bonding pairs up here and the bonding pair in our bond. So the greatest repulsion will be felt between the non-bonding pairs, then bonding pair to non-bonding pair repulsion is next in line and that the repulsion between the two bonding pairs is the least. And this is why we see water forming that bent shape and why we don't draw it like this. <clears throat> if the bonding pairs and non-bonding pairs had equal repulsion, water would actually form a straight line, a linear molecule. It doesn't because these non-bonding pairs actually push down on the bonding pairs, forcing the hydrogens to come closer together and give the non-bonding pairs more space. So when we look at this, if we have even repulsion, they're able to get away from it, the electrons are able to arrange themselves as far apart as possible, we will have a linear molecule. Remember, we're only considering the bonding pairs in this case. So we have hydrogen and chlorine. So if we have a look, HCl, we have no non-bonding pair bonding pair repulsion. So if we have only 
um, the two atoms, we will see a linear bond. Okay, so we see this with HCl, HF, HBr. Um, we'll see it with Cl2 and F2. We also see it with carbon dioxide. We have no bonding pairs on the central atom here. So uh, no non-bonding pairs. So the electrons will arrange themselves to be as far apart as possible in these bonds. So the double bonds will be opposite each other because this is as far apart as they can get. So we end up with a linear molecule. We will see this in things like N2, O2, and even in organic molecules like C2H4. This double bond here will be linear and then you'll notice we have a different bonding angle between the carbon and hydrogen bonds. One of the important ones for us to understand is tetrahedral. Often we will have seen tetrahedral molecules drawn in this way, where the bond angle here is actually 90 degrees, and that's not the case. If we think about things in three-dimensional shape, space, what we can have is this one would be sticking out, this one would go in and we would actually have a bond angle of 109.5 when we arrange these in three dimensions rather than on the flat shape. So this is as far apart as they can get. So if we have four bonding pairs and no non-bonding pairs on the central atom, we will always have a tetrahedral molecule. Trigonal pyramidal is the first one where we start to see the influence of lone pairs on our molecule. And we see this with ammonia in that we have the non-bonding pair on top, then we have three bonding pairs. This non-bonding pair or lone pair we can see here, this is representative of the electron density around that. And we can see that the non-bonding pair has a much greater repulsive effect than these ones down here. So it's pushing these down away from linear. So what we actually see here is that we have three bonding pairs and one non-bonding pair. If we have this combination, that non-bonding pair being on the central atom, it will always be what we call trigonal pyramidal. So this is a triangular based pyramid, but the name that we use for the structure is trigonal pyramidal. Our next shape is V-shaped or bent. We can use either term for this. And this is where we have two bonding pairs and two lone pairs. We saw this when we drew out the structure of water before. We had our two non-bonding pairs and our two bonding pairs. And we can see here that it forms the shape of an inverted V. If I draw it this way, we can see the V a little bit easier. So we can call this V-shaped or bent. And in this case, the non-bonding pairs are pushing those hydrogens down away from the linear arrangement. We can see these also in things like SO2 or H2O. We see V-shaped turning up pretty much any time we have a water, an oxygen attached to two other things. So it might be even OF2, we would see this bent shape coming about from the oxygen, with the oxygen being our central atom here. So you can see here that we have a number of molecules that will form these. We have linear, where they are 180 degrees, SO2, which is bent, which is 120 and less. It's much smaller in water. It's about 104 in water. Ammonia gives us 106.7, which is our trigonal pyramidal, trigonal planar. And of course, we also had, don't forget, the tetrahedral, which is our 109.5. Just a note on trigonal planar. As we said in a previous video, boron is happy with six electrons in its valence shell. So anytime we have boron, we're going to see this trigonal planar structure where we have three bonding pairs set evenly around the central atom. So essentially they're going to form the vertices of an equilateral triangle and our bond angles are going to be 120 degrees here because we're going to form the vertices of a triangle. So when we talk about 
VESPA or a valent shell electron pair repulsion theory, this also allows us to deal with double bonds when working out shape. Double bonds we consider a negative charge center and they're considered one sort of bonding site. So in the case of this molecule here where we have a double bond Cl and Cl, we would have the two bonding pairs here, we have no non-bonding pairs, and we have this here which we count sort of like a single bond even though it's a double. So this would mean that we have three things attached to the central atom, so this we would define as being a trigonal planar arrangement. So that's a summary of our structures. In VCE, we don't need to know the actual bond angles, but we do be able, need to be able to predict the shape and geometry around a central atom. And we will do some molecule building and practice of this next time we're in class. For now, I would like you to pause the video, have a go at drawing the correct structural formula for these molecules remembering to get the shape right. Is it going to be linear? Is it going to be trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal, or tetrahedral? Remember, look at the central atom, see if there are any non-bonding pairs on the central atom. If it contains a non-bonding pair, it's going to push it away to one of our non-linear, non-flat structures. Have a go and come back and check for the answer. Okay, hopefully you pause the video and this is what you have come up with. If not, let's go through them quickly together. Our SH2, when we draw the Lewis dot structures for these, we will find that we have two non-bonding pairs on the sulfur and these will pull this down into a bent shape or V-shaped. For PCl3, we're going to have five valence electrons that will put the lone pair on the central atom, so the three chlorines must be arranged below in a trigonal pyramidal. CF4, we have four bonds around the carbon, all single, no non-bonding pairs, so this will be tetrahedral. For hydrogen cyanide, we have a triple bond to nitrogen and a single bond to the hydrogen. So we have two bonding arrangements. They will be distributed as far apart as possible. So it will be a linear structure. COF2, we've seen before, we have two bonds to the fluorines and the extra bonding center with the double bond. So this is arranged in a trigonal planar, okay, because it will be flat trigonal planar arrangement. CS2 is going to be linear. And then C2F4, we saw this before, we have a linear bond in here between the two carbons, but then around each carbon, we have a trigonal planar. So if we have more common, uh, sorry, more complex molecules, we can actually have different shapes within molecules. So the larger and more complex the molecules get, the more complex shapes that we get, and we tend to refine it by looking at around the central carbon atoms. So in this case, we have trigonal planar arrangement around both these carbons. Okay, this may seem a little bit confusing at the moment, but we will have a lot of practice in class, and we will build some models to help us visualize these as well. So just a note on the representation of models. Often we will use structural formulas and Lewis dot structures, but when we see images online or using 3D modeling software, we can see these ball and stick and space filling models and representations. Space filling gives us a better idea of where the electron cloud is and how they overlap in terms of where bonding is formed in molecules. Ball and stick are really good for us to see the angles and the shapes and the relative size of the atoms. However, they do give us this misconception that bonds are where we have sort of two atoms stuck together at the end of a stick rather than this overlapping of electron clouds. But all these representations have their place and give us different information and allow us to see different things. So if we consider each one of these, we can see that the electron dots show us clearly where we have electrons being shared, but it doesn't show the relative size or the shape. 
Valence structures can give us the shape um, of the molecule if we draw them appropriately. Ball and stick will give us the relative size and the shape. And then space filling allows us to see, we can't see the bond angles, but we can see the relative size and shape with the overlapping of the electron clouds and those. So each one has their strengths and weaknesses in the way that we represent things. Okay, that's it from me and I'll see you in class.